Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of our first ever virtual summer summit. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Mona, and I'm the program manager here in, sunny, in Silicon Valley for our FinTech team. Today, we'll be kicking it off uh, with opening remarks by George Damuni, our plug and play ventures partner. And then we'll have a keynote by Uzma Makdumi, who is currently the head of payment partnerships at Google. We'll be following up with the presentations by 21 of our batch 11 fintech companies and wrapping it up with opening remarks, uh, with closing remarks and corporate innovation um, awards. Now on to ho housekeeping. All attendees uh, shall remain muted throughout the entire session. Um, please use the Q&A feature down below uh, to ask any questions. We will not be doing a live Q&A. However, we do have someone manning the Q&A chat and we will get back to you as quickly as we can. Remember to head over to Brella to network with our startups. If you have not done so already, please use the QR code on your screen to sign up and access Brella to network with today's attendees. If you can access the browser version of Brella, you can even hop on video calls directly through the website, which is pretty, pretty neat as it eliminates the whole process of setting up a call. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to George DeMuni, our Plug and Play Ventures partner. Welcome, George. Thank you, Mona, appreciate it. Hi, everybody. So really excited to be here today. I really appreciate all of you taking your morning to spend it with us or your evening if you're in Europe or Asia. So as Mona mentioned, my name is George DeMuni. I am one of the partners here on the Ventures team at Plug and Play. Quick background on myself. I started with the firm about seven years ago and really grew with the company. So today I manage about half of our investments that go through Plug and Play's programs, as well as about 100 people on the Ventures team. That, that work with us to source, screen, vet, and invest in companies. Um, some of my good, good companies here are listed below. Um, so luckily I have a good track record and they keep letting me invest at Plug and Play. So really fortunate to be here and, and thank you for, for having me. So I know a lot of folks have been to Plug and Play before. Again, as Mona mentioned, this is our first virtual summer summit. So we wanted to spend some time to just describe what Plug and Play does prior to jumping into the exciting portion, the startup portion. And it really dates back to this picture. So this is actually the first 35 employees of Google. And Syed Amidi, our founder and CEO, owns a bunch of real estate properties. This one is actually on 165 University Avenue in Palo Alto, that main drag that goes all the way to Stanford University. That's where actually Google, Logitech, PayPal, and Danger all started when they were just startups. Two people that grew to 50 people within his building. Um, that, that, that person on the bottom left in, on the phone is actually Omid Kordestani, one of the advisors for Plug and Play, one of Syed's best friends as well. Um, and he's actually the current chairman of Twitter. On the top right, we have Marissa Mayer, who became the CEO of Yahoo. And uh, through these relationships, we actually invested in her new company, uh, very stealthy called Lumi Labs. But, you know, uh, PayPal was actually one of the first investments for the Amidi Group. Um, Max Lefton came in, didn't have any credit. So instead of paying them rent money, they exchanged two years of free rent for equity in the company. And that later became one of the best and first tech investments for the Amidi Group, which later became plug and play. So fast forward to today. So we're really two things. One, we're an early stage investor, as I mentioned. We're actually the, one of the more active investors in the world, investing in about 200 startups per year, mostly in the seed and series A stage. The second thing we do is a global innovation platform where we connect startups to corporations for potential licensing deals, business development opportunities, investment, or even acquisition. And as mentioned, some of our uh, corporate partners are listed here. Very, very excited to, to show some of you guys uh, the name brands that we have working with us, like Coca-Cola, P&G, ExxonMobil. We have Walmart and Amazon, so we're, we're covering a lot of commerce in the US, and I'll touch on our FinTech partners later on. This is actually my favorite slide. So this is our portfolio slide, almost our bragging slide, if you wish. Uh, we're lucky enough to have 11 unicorns in the plug and play portfolio. A unicorn is when a company reaches over a billion dollars in valuation. So I spoke about a few of them before, Dropbox, PayPal, Lending Club, all legacy companies in our portfolio. More recently, companies like N26, uh, a mobile-only bank out of Germany that got a 3.5 billion valuation. 
apply board that just raised at a 1.4 billion valuation out of Canada three weeks ago. And the one that's really close to my heart, Honey, that got acquired by PayPal for 4 billion all cash. We were their first investor when there was just one and a half employees on the team. So the FinTech program. So we were lucky enough to start our FinTech program over five years ago today. And since then we've accelerated 300 startups uh, in our programs alone, conducted about 200 pilots, uh, averaging about 40 pilots per year between startups and corporations, which is crazy in the financial, in, uh, financial services space. We have 94 FinTech portfolio companies and over well over hundred investments in, within those companies. 70 of our partners in the FI space and 10 locations internationally. So we really wanna highlight and uh, really pay attention to each and every one of our FinTech corporate partners. We really thank you and really, uh, you know, uh, get, for giving us a chance and opportunity to help you with your innovation journey. We couldn't really be here without you guys. So really want to highlight each and every single one of you. Thank you very, very much for uh, trusting us with your innovation journey and connecting you with the right startups to work with uh, and, and pilot and license for your own businesses. So really uh, couldn't be here without you and we can't thank you enough. So as mentioned, we are taking over the world. We have 34 offices now around the world. And one more slide, please. These are our uh, FinTech locations. So 10 of those internationally right now. Um, we launched Amsterdam with ING in June of last year uh, and in Sao Paulo, Brazil on uh, September of last year with a number of banks and FIs over there. And I wanted to focus on one program in particular in Paris, um, which, you know, BNP Paribas was a partner in Silicon Valley for about two years before they decided to move over to, to Paris and, and partner with us. So we launched that program in 2017 as a way to get closer to their business units, C-level executives, and really decision makers. And the program is really unique where every company that goes through that program ends up getting a pilot with the bank. So we've accelerated 43 startups so far um, since 2017 and conducted 54 pilots between startups and BNP Paribas. And the, the crazy thing about this is 35% of those pilots ended up into a full production, saving the bank millions, tens of millions of dollars in cost reduction and uh, digital transformation. So again, thank you very much BNP. Uh, and just one more slide, I wanna thank the plug and play team. So this is a FinTech team. Uh, we couldn't fit on one slide, so we put it on two. Thank you. So uh, really these, we, I, I just feel like we're so fortunate to work with such great people on the team that really go out above and beyond to help uh, each and every one of our partners. So when you guys see them on a web webinar, please give them a virtual high five. And hopefully when we're all back in person, we can give each other a real high five. So a few um, FinTech trends before I wrap up here. So a lot of our corporate partners have asked us what we're seeing in the market as it pertains to FinTech and how COVID-19 has affected that. So one of those um, trends was digital transactions will rise. I think it's no secret. Consumers are seeking more hygienic and convenient ways for payments. And it's crazy to think that e-commerce alone jumped 20% of the overall uh, commerce spend during the pandemic. Before this, it was roughly 10%. And it took us 10 years to get there. So 10 years for 10%, three months for the next 10%, which has been incredible. A few of our companies that we invested in the space, Flutterwave, which allows uh, mostly cash-based societies, developing countries to transact digitally. So the likes of Airbnb, Uber, and, and whatnot can now transact within Africa, for example, and Charge After, which allows lenders to compete at, for POS financing on e-commerce. Another trend is an emphasis on mobile first and mobile only. So companies like Mantle, which allows seamless onboarding uh, for credit unions and banks. I just opened up a Marcus by Goldman Sachs account and my account was funded in less than three minutes. I was fully onboarded KYC and it was, it was just an incredible experience. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> and companies like Albert that uh, really help the Gen Z's and millennials manage their money so they can you know, go to dinner every night, afford to you know, buy their car in the next year and then maybe a house in 10 years. 
they just got $50 million from Capital G, one of Google venture arms. Digital identity, this is huge, especially given now everything is going into the digital space. Uh, companies like Onfido, helping background checking for the shared economy. Uh, they just received $100 million from TPG and Instant, which is a single sign-on, a single source of identity for e-commerce. And of course, we think digital banking will dominate the new to consumer banking customer. Um, starting all the way from teenager or preteens, um, companies like Jazby play into this space where they manage the parent-child finance relationship as it pertains to allowances. And those allowances on the Jazby platform can be shopped with in a virtual mall for those preteens and teens. So it's an incredible way to get them while they're, get the consumer really, really young and then grow with them in their journey. And then of course, N26, our mobile only bank out of Germany that opens and operates all the accounts from the mobile device. And with that being said, that was my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, my name is George Demoni. It was a pleasure to speak with you all today. I really hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And if, you have, if you'd like to contact me, my email is george at pnptc.com. PNPTC and with that, I'll pack it, pass it back to Mona. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. That was great. Thanks for that overview of plug and play and our FinTech vertical and our investments, of course. So next up, I'd like to welcome Uzma Makdumi to the stage. Uh, she's currently the head of payment partnerships at Google, where she helped launch Google Pay internationally in multiple markets. She now leads new business development initiatives for consumer payments globally, working with banks, payment networks, regulators, and financial technology companies to incubate new use cases to support consumers and merchants. Prior to Google, Uzma was leading commercialization for Visa and was also one of the early product managers for mobile at Yahoo. She's been a consultant at McKinsey, advising high-tech companies, and started her career as an engineer at Bose Corporations. Uzma does a double majored at MIT and holds an MBA from Stanford. She's also a certified leadership and executive coach, an advisory board member for Rise Up for Money 2020 to empower women leaders in payments and a startup advisor. She even served as a mentor for our batch companies. Now, if that's not an impressive background, I don't know what is, please welcome Uzma to the stage. Thank you so much, Nadine. Let me just present my slides here. So thank you, Mona. I uh, uh, really appreciate uh, being invited to be part of this uh, virtual summit uh, at a very exciting inflection point in uh, fintech. Um, so uh, let me start by introducing myself as well. I, as, Mon uh, as uh, Mona mentioned, I'm head of payment partnerships at Google, where I'm driving some of our new business initiatives. Um, and there's a lot going on, I have to say. So. COVID and this quarantine um, or lockdown period are perhaps the most seminal event of our lifetimes. And uh, given that, uh, there's a lot that uh, we are seeing in terms of evolving trends in the fintech space due to payments. And I wanted to use this opportunity to just share my thoughts on how those trends are evolving and how we might embrace those and move forward from here as a fintech industry. So uh, the theme, uh, the title here is a FinTech from BC to AD, BC being before COVID and AD being after domestication with the event of COVID uh, being pretty critical for 2020 and beyond. So um, I have worked in the uh, payments and FinTech space for about 12 years now and worked on uh, uh, activities and initiatives across multiple markets over the six continents. And one thing I've learned, or at least a few things I've learned actually, are that there's no one size fits all when it comes to payments and fintech. Every market is at a different stage of digitization, uh, whether it is real-time payment trails that governments and regulators are trying to install, or even private companies for that matter, or whether it's digital wallets taking shape, uh, or uh, cash-based markets and governments trying to digitize cash. So markets are not the same. Number two, I would say that money is not simple anywhere, whether it is accepting money, saving money, growing money, 
or just doing overall financial planning, whether you're a consumer or a merchant. And three, given that, there is still a lot more room for innovation. And that's why we're all here. Um, so I have a friend named Sarah who uh, has a small restaurant here in the Bay Area. Uh, hers was a very popular restaurant. She relied a lot on foot traffic before uh, COVID virus hit, uh, employed a handful of staff and collected payments in cash, check, and through digital wallets at her point of sale system. So business was thriving. And then suddenly, COVID hit like a shockwave around the whole world. And it came suddenly like a natural disaster, war and financial crisis all at once, something the world has not actually experienced before. And it changed everything around Sarah. Uh, she had to furlough some of her staff, shut down her restaurant temporarily until she opened for takeout only after adopting some very stringent hygiene measures, uh, struggled to uh, apply for a PPP loan and uh, also had to help her staff uh, obtain and manage stimulus checks from the government as everyone tried to adjust to this new reality. Uh, not to mention, uh, added to her plate were the burdens of homeschooling her kids and dropping off groceries to her elderly parents, which is actually the reality for a lot of folks here today. Um, Sarah was struggling to manage her working capital and finances. Her bank branch was closed and there were long hold times on the phone. And actually this was not limited to Sarah. I mean, there are constituents all over the ecosystem that are, have been struggling because of this. So consumers, you know, are struggling and looking for financial help, uh, especially those who are unbanked and underbanked, uh, who are now not able to mobilize and shift to, uh, and adjust towards um, digital uh, payments, et cetera. For merchants, many of them who were relying on foot traffic are struggling to stay afloat. I, I know many merchants myself that uh, in my neighborhood that have actually had to shut down, unfortunately, over the past couple of months. And banks are struggling to adjust. They, digital transformation was always part of the agenda, it, uh, but they weren't expecting the shockwave to come so soon. And so banks have been struggling to manage their branch operations, uh, their ATM operations, and encouraging the use of digital payments uh, for hygiene measures. And overall, we've seen a reduction in spend uh, and a shift of payments overall from offline or physical world spending to online as everything from buying essentials like groceries or toilet paper has moved to the online world where people are trying to purchase online and have it shipped home. And these impacts are expected to last uh, even after this economy starts to open up and even after there might be hopefully a vaccine, uh, some of this change in behavior we expect to see uh, continue over time. So for now, as we mentioned, consumers are shifting their behavior to purchase more online and uh, relying on entertainment to keep themselves busy given new social distancing rules. There's a shift towards cashless transactions and nobody wants to touch cash. And there's a focus on overall financial wellness as well as you know, some attempts at physical wellness as well. And over the long term, we expect that homes will continue to become multifunctional, right? It's the place where you work. A lot of companies have already said that users can, can that their employees can work from home indefinitely. They've also become your gyms as gyms are closed. So people are working out in a big way at home. And they're also the place where you do your gaming and entertainment overall. We are seeing trends for local community-based spending as consumers want to buy from, from shops that they, uh, they prefer locally that they don't want to go out of business. And we're seeing a trend of reverse urbanization where people are moving out of big cities and uh, moving into suburbs. I have a lot of my colleagues in New York City that, that have actually escaped the city and moved, uh, moved out to other uh, more suburban locations. On the merchant side, we are seeing that they are uh, trying to figure out how to manage their working capital and how to plan uh, for their finances so they're not strapped for cash and, uh, and uh, getting loans at the right time in the right place. 
there's a shift towards uh, online uh, marketplaces and shifting online. I think a lot of these merchants are finding that uh, places like DoorDash and Amazon are both a blessing and a curse for them uh, because obviously they're enabling them to become digital and online, but then there's also that cut that they're having to give up this. It doesn't come uh, for free. And, uh, and of course, uh, trying to embrace contactless payments as quickly as possible uh, in order to uh, uh, adjust to this new environment. And over the long term, we expect that these merchants will start to adjust uh, to new business models, whether it is supporting customers with you know, buy online, pay, uh, pick up in store through curbside pickups, uh, whether it is uh, in, uh, installment billing or afterpay for users, whether it's video commerce or commerce through uh, homes, uh, there's a lot of uh, focus on automation and how to reduce dependencies uh, on uh, supply chain uh, vectors that can actually uh, uh, be shocked uh, by systems like this. So there's a lot of focus on trying to diversify the supply chain across uh, multiple providers and, and especially sourcing locally is something that I've seen as well. And on the bank side, uh, everyone is accelerating their digital transformation efforts. Uh, there is an emphasis on figuring out how to do more self-service and branchless banking for consumers. Banks are also trying to uh, focus on credit management as you have uh, both consumers and small businesses that are either defaulting on loans, coming to search for new loans, or looking for new financing. And competition has picked up as well, because now for larger banks, having that branch network is no longer a competitive advantage in this, uh, in this environment. And secondly, you've got challenges such as Stripe and Square and PayPal and others that are trying to get into merchant credit and doing it in a simple and easy way. Over the long term, we see banks thinking about uh, consolidation uh, as you have some that might be struggling uh, and may not be able to recover from this. And then uh, banks looking for banking as a service. So this is an opportunity for a number of the startups here, uh, providing technology and solutions to banks so that they can provide banking as a service. And finally, I would say with, uh, with the shift to e-commerce, e-commerce has grown about 44% in the last few weeks. Um, there is obviously a need for increased cybersecurity and fraud management because once commerce shifts online, there's obviously naturally uh, increase in fraud as well. So um, the picture has been a little bit bleak over the last few weeks uh, with the economy facing the deeper shock since the Great Depression and reduction in overall spend uh, given uh, consumers are now focusing on buying the essentials. And in fact, even buying from brands that they've never tried before. Uh, travel is down. Uh, and, uh, you know, other sort of discretionary spend has come down as well. Uh, there is an increase in bankruptcies. And, uh, you know, we've seen a number of uh, chains even uh, file for bankruptcy and others shut down altogether. And uh, consolidation as well, uh, from, um, for, because some companies are unable to actually raise cash. However, for the ones that have actually built a large cash reserve over the past 10 years, given the economy was booming, there is an opportunity here for them to perhaps uh, buy out or partner with or take an investment in uh, companies given uh, more attractive valuations perhaps. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there is a need for diversifying the supply chain because the supply chain shock now has been sort of deeper and more sprawling uh, than that from the trade war over the past couple of years. And it's expected to last longer than that which happens after a natural disaster or a flood. So uh, there is a lot of adjustment that has happened over the last uh, couple of, uh, I would say over the last three months. Um, on the left-hand side here, uh, you can see the expenses of consumers versus their income for a broad range of incomes. And uh, you know, low-income Americans have been struggling even before this. Uh, and they were, you know, a, a number of them had barely enough savings to last a rainy day. And this has been, you know, uh, this has been a difficult stretch for them. And for banks, uh, you have a pressure on revenues with reduced spending, which results in reduced interchange income. Uh, you have uh, reduced uh, interest uh, and interest earnings as a result of that. In some cases, 
uh, smaller loans uh, and loan origination and fee waivers that they're having to give out. So there's pressure on the revenue side and on the cost side, there's pressure also because there's losses from loans and there's just a lot of, uh, you know, um, a number of calls coming in and expenses to manage um, uh, manage the consumer base, whether it's consumers or even small businesses. However, on uh, you know the, the, on the positive side, we have seen finally a, a sort of a breakout moment uh, for e-commerce. And as George mentioned earlier as well, you can see that uh, over the last eight weeks, we've seen a big spike up in terms of e-commerce as compared to the last 10 years. And you see companies like Shopify and others that are providing online stores are really coming in handy for a lot of merchants that are trying to shift from the offline world to the online world. And so coming back to my friend, Sarah, who runs the restaurant, uh, what she's done over this period now has act she's actually uh, worked to build out an online store. So she's got her menu online and she's taking orders online. Uh, she managed to sell gift cards as well in order to, uh, to basically have generate some sales now that can be redeemed later when the economy actually picks up. Uh, she um, was quite innovative in the sense of uh, collecting donations from people uh, so that she could deliver food to frontline workers, so doctors and, 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 uh, and uh, nurses. So she was collecting donations and delivering food, so that actually kept her staff going and her orders and business going. And finally, she moved towards the frozen food delivery model as well. So she started uh, creating a bunch of food and shipping it out to people where they were getting tired of home cooking. And uh, so this way, she actually kept her sales going as well as helped the gig economy workers as well uh, by encouraging everyone uh, to tip heavily. So while Sarah managed to adjust, unfortunately, there were a few others who weren't able to be quite as flexible uh, because the social distancing didn't favor them. For example, cleaning services. You can't actually go out and clean if people are not uh, if people are not supposed to be in close contact with each other. And there were others as well that had businesses that were impacted and couldn't pivot quite as easily to the e-commerce world. So where do we go from here, given what we've seen so far? There's a lot of opportunity and I wanted to share my perspectives on that. So um, let's start with a quote from Sundar, who is the uh, CEO of uh, Google and Alphabet. Uh, what we heard from him was that the world is not going to go back to what it used to be before right? We are seeing a change that will be lasting. And we've seen acceleration of digital services, whether it's work and education and medicine, shopping, entertainment, all of that is going online, right? I have seen pediatricians and doctors now talking about how convenient it is to do, you know, telehealth and teleappointments rather than coming into the office. So we're expecting these changes to last. And so how do we embrace these changes and move forward from here? So what we are seeing overall at Google and otherwise is that things are becoming remote, right? Whether it's conferences like these or others, or whether it's education and even colleges are starting to say that for the next year at least, they will be having digital only uh, uh, or uh, online only lectures. We've talked about businesses going all digital to adjust to this. Commerce is becoming e-commerce now. Uh, there's the, the lines between offline and online are totally blurring as consumers are buying more in store and uh, buying more online and going to pick up in store at curbsides where possible. And entertainment is becoming big. Uh, people are starting to use a lot more. Uh, people are starting to consume a lot of content while they're at home and unable to socialize in the way that they used to before. So um, what, what we are seeing here is you know, there are three phases really to this uh, change, right? There was the initial shock factor where suddenly schools are closing and offices are shut down and, you know, uh, everything around you is, is changing in a rapid way. And then there's panic buying and everyone's buying toilet paper and hand sanitizers. And, and so there was that shock wave initially where people were, you know, adjusting. I would say we are now in the step change phase, which is more of the adjustment phase. While the first one was sort of more anxiety driven and panic driven, this is now the, okay, I've accepted this is what's happening. I've accepted that I'm going to be buying or going grocery shopping every two weeks or ordering online. 
and I've accepted that I prefer not to pull out cash from the ATM and use cash, but use digital payments. So there is that adjustment phase where people are adjusting. And the other thing we're noticing in this adjustment phase is that the, that the behaviors that we see now are likely going to last for quite a while. So whether it is entertainment becoming more popular, we know a lot of people have been uh, using uh, a lot of cooking recipes as people shelter in kitchen, uh, as uh, folks have told me. Uh, Duolingo has experienced like a 91% surge in their traffic as people are trying to learn new languages while they have the time at home. So entertainment has become big. Essentialism is the new consumer behavior at this time, buying more essential things, foregoing some of the uh, you know, uh, premium or luxury items. And third is digital first is now becoming digital only, where people are now experiencing things on digital for the first time and likely will adopt that going forward. And the next phase after that is really the acceleration phase. What do we do from here, given where we are at now? So some of the things we're going to see here now are that health and safety are going to become critically important, whereas before they were cost factors, now they're going to be growth factors. So you see you know, airlines like United and Southwest now touting hygiene and health and safety as, as reasons for differentiation. And overall, we're going to see supply chain diversification as well, and people trying to buy locally a lot more as they want to keep their businesses, local businesses alive. Uh, I've touched on some of these before, but basically for consumers, you know, they'll be relying a lot on robots and AI. Homes are becoming multifunctional, as I said. Um, there's focus on digital inclusion, wellness, and cashless operations. For merchants now, they will be focused on a technology solution. I think no, people will not be questioning anymore why they need to turn on contactless acceptance at POS terminals, a struggle that I dealt with, you know, a few years ago where merchants had contactless terminals but just didn't feel the need to turn them on. Uh, so you're going to see supply chain diversification. You're going to see financial planning being big. You're going to see new business models and you're going to see uh, you know, merchants trying to figure out how to build trust and loyalty and offers sitting afar and not necessarily having that regular contact with, with uh, their consumers. And then for banking, this is the digital banking tipping point, right? As banks focus on banking as a service, consolidation, security, and revenue compression from traditional means and sort of diversifying to new business models and digital transformation. Uh, so uh, an SVP at a credit union I spoke to recently said that they've had to fundamentally change the way they do their work. And they've had to do that very, very quickly. So. Uh, going from sort of having branch presence and having that regular engagement with their constituents at the credit union to quickly going digital and having drive up drop boxes and having Zoom meetings and doing everything digitally, digitally and eliminating uh, paper as much as possible. So they've had to spun, spin up teams as, as fast as possible. And now they're trying to figure out how do we manage engagement with our members of the credit union and be able to cross sell and upsell without that physical presence. So that's what we are seeing across the board, even from someone as small as a credit union. So with that, um, let me share some thoughts on what financial institu institutions can do uh, to accelerate and to embrace this change. So the first and foremost, I would say is to put the customer first. So whether that customer is a consumer or a small business that might be struggling thinking about their needs and what you can do to actually build up that loyalty now by supporting them. So for example, uh, for you know, some of the unbanked, underbanked, how can you help them transact on e-commerce? Are there virtual cards that you can quickly deliver? Are there low KYC or eKYC options for them to quickly open a bank account? Uh, uh, and and uh, as George mentioned earlier, he was able to open a Marcus account in three minutes. How can banks enable or you know, FIs in general enable users to open up accounts quickly, to educate them, provide financial and digital literacy to get them going? Second is really solving for authentication. So this is related to identity and, and overall authentication for transactions. So now a consumer walking into a, a branch with a mask on is, is not the need to call security. It's actually going to be the norm. People walking into a branch trying to 
interact with uh, you know with uh, your sales staff or with uh, uh, employees at the branch how do you deal with the fact that online and offline are merging if the transactions are now similar where people are just pulling up to a target and seeing their name and getting stuff put into their trunk uh, is there a need for different uh, rules and different interchange for offline and online transactions third is how do you think about disrupting existing business models so for example in india uh, we worked extensively with the banks uh, to launch google pay in india and india is a market where which where you know most of the transactions were being done in cash there wasn't a lot of merchant acceptance of digital payments so and and merchants were used to collecting cash they perceived it as free and consumers were used to paying in cash and as you think about trying to digitize cash in order to incent merchants to actually accept digital payments right you've got to reduce the processing cost of accepting digital payments to be close to cash which is perceived as zero and so you disrupt the model from being one where it's transaction based revenue to one where transactions are lower cost so they actually flowing through your systems now but then you can upsell and cross sell higher value margin your higher margin products that have a potentially higher attach rate uh so this is the time to stop thinking about perhaps the models that have worked and the status quo pnls that you've had for the past 10 plus years and think about well what do i need to give up in the short term to get medium and longer term gains uh i would say increase an in automation so how do we reduce reliance on paper and people and focus a bit more on uh, enabling interactions that are higher value add so for example even reliance on uh, on branches is there a way for you to reduce operating cost uh, of branches by moving to a more fidelity like model right where you have a few service centers for high value uh, servicing in urban centers and 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 not as many branches as before so rethinking the word branch strategy perhaps even rethinking how to repurpose atms right could they be ways to open up accounts or or uh, you know provide paper so there's a lot that can be thought about there as people prefer to move away from cash uh, withdrawals and deposits finally using digital innovation digital transformation to actually solve real problems versus pet projects there's a lot that can be solved so really prioritizing where the pain points are for your constituents and trying to prioritize those projects uh, would be helpful and then uh, exploring new partnerships this is the time to think outside the box like apple and and google are partnering for the first time on contact contact uh, tracing uh, for you know for the greater good uh, what partnerships can uh, fi's think about that could support the society at large right perhaps cooperative competition and then finally uh this might be the time to sort of bust the silos bundle products think about how you can uh compete in a in a situation where consumers are coming up with different needs and are wanting to have a very seamless experience so what is what what can be done to really provide an overall solution versus sort of a siloed uh you know solution especially for larger banks where things are done by different organizations how can you create solutions and packages that are useful for consumers as well as uh, businesses and then for startups i would say uh you know this is what i talk uh, this is what i talk to some st uh, startups that i uh, am engaged with Uh, the first one is fairly obvious. Obviously, manage cash burn rate. Uh, so you've got to be in this for the long haul. So manage where you're spending. And then uh, second is really prioritize and stay focused. This is a time to manage uh, and and figure out what are the top product areas that you want to deliver on for the short term, medium term, long term, and uh, what are the verticals or, or partnerships. that are needed right so you know if your product is suitable for five different verticals what are the one or two verticals that you really want to focus on for now uh, and and prioritize within them and even within those verticals who are some of the top uh, customers or partners that you want to seek out uh, so that you can be laser focused on on delivery and execution and then finally is uh 
you know, while it may take time, especially in, in the fintech space, I've been in, in, in this area for, as I said, over a decade. And I know that, you know, partnerships with some of the larger FIs can take, you know, a couple of years. Uh, so while those are obviously big and, and can be uh, uh, game changing for your startup, uh, what else can you do while those are happening? What else can you do in terms of uh, perhaps generating some other quick wins because success begets success and you keep the momentum going with your team and there's, uh, you know, uh, higher morale, etc. cetera. So, uh, so uh, that's basically what my advice is to startups. And I would say, I want to wrap by saying that this is for many of you in the audience here, this is the moment that you've been waiting for, right? For your digital transformation projects that you've been touting to finally take flight. And uh, as Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft uh, said uh, in his Q3 earnings call that we have seen uh, two years worth of digital transformation over the past two months. And there's a lot more to come. And I look forward to seeing what, what more we'll be doing as an industry over the coming months and years. So with that, let me say thank you. I really appreciate being here and sh spending some time with all of you. And if you need to contact me, I can be reached on LinkedIn. Thank you. And Mona, back over to you. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isma, for your time. Um, I know you put a lot of effort into this and thank you for sharing all your thoughts with us. I, I know you gave a lot of our financial institutions and startups and other attendees a little bit of food for thought. So. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. And with that, that wraps up our keynote. Uh, we're gonna hop on over to our startup presentations. We have 21 startup presentations, which sounds like a lot, but they're only four minutes, so bear with us. Um, if you wanna network with any of our startups, please use the Brella app, just a quick reminder there. Um, if you have any questions, ask us in the Q&A. And yeah, without further ado, I'm gonna start with the first presentation. This is gonna be one up. They're headquartered in San Francisco, and they're the fastest online accounting software for small business owners and accountants. Features include accounting, invoicing, inventory, and customer relationship um, management. OneUp merges banking and business all into one. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Francois to the stage. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Francois. I see you at OneUp. So OneUp is dedicated to our retail banking industry serving uh, small businesses. So what is really banking and business all in one? Uh, OneUp is fully integrated uh, within your banking portal for SMBs in order to increase your net banking revenue. So what you get? Categorized bank feeds have 95% AI accurate accounting entries. Then your customers will get cash forecast automated and customizable by each of your clients. Then they could use invoicing from quotes to cash and of course send invoicing to their customers. At the very end of the process, eventually they're going to receive personalized smart advisors to offer the right financial product at the right time to the right customer. So um, let's watch a small video uh, about um, what we delivered to BNP Paribas as a marketing video to explain to the customers how the solution and the new portal works all together. Here we are. Do you know what all these entrepreneurs have in common? It's me, the intelligent business assistant built into your BNB Purvis banking portal. Mark is a very busy business owner. In the morning, he takes a look at supplier invoices. Before, in order to pay his suppliers, Mark used to do everything by hand. Now, from a PDF or a photo, I recognize and save the invoice automatically. Then, when the time is right, I notify him of the payments to be made in your banking portal. At the last step, when the supplier is paid, I perform the bank reconciliation automatically. 
For Steve and his partner, it's nonstop. Thanks to me, Steve is relaxed because I automatically tell him which invoices he needs to send and remind him to follow up with his customers. He decides which customers to remind. When the payment arrives, I tell him, and I know he's satisfied. In the afternoon, it's a direct sale in David's shop. His turnover increases, it's a beautiful day, he can present his brand new collection. Before, David didn't have all the financial tools he needed to run his business. Now, with the help of my business assistant, he can make decisions faster. And because he thinks less about administration, he has more time to devote to developing his business. To help Jennifer to anticipate the coming weeks, I automatically calculate her cash flow forecast. For this, I use her past transactions and his upcoming customer and supplier due dates. Jennifer appreciates this, and moreover, she can also adjust them so she knows where she is going. As a business assistant, I make sure that the confidentiality of your data is respected. You choose when and with whom you share it. Whether it is your BNP Paribus advisor, your accountant, or other partners, my role is to make your life as easy as possible by simplifying your management. This way, you can stay focused on the heart of your business. I just want to thank you, Playing and Play. Thanks to you, we were able to deliver to BNP Paribas uh, our success story. And I'm sure that between us, more is to come. And thank you all for listening to, to me today. Take care. Bye. All right. Thank you so much, Francois. Next up, we have HyperScience. Uh, they automate document processing for some of the world's largest organizations. Please welcome Whitney. Hi, everyone. My name is Whitney LeClaire. I am a partner manager with HyperScience. At its core, HyperScience is an intelligent data processing company. We classify documents and extract data out of these documents. HyperScience was founded in 2014 with our focus really being on the product. We went to market in 2018 and have gained quite a bit of traction in just over two years. We have offices in New York City, which is where our headquarters is located, as well as London and Sofia, Bulgaria. Today, HyperScience is a Series C company, and we have approximately 150 employees, but are continuing to grow even throughout this tough economic time. And finally, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see some of our accolades. HyperScience was named a major contender for Everest Group and a 2019 Cool Vendor by Gardner. So this slide here will show you the key market sectors that we really focus on, insurance, financial services, and government, as well as a few of the use cases that we've seen success with. Here's a look at two of the most common business challenges that there has not been a fix for. The first is manual data entry. Manual data entry results in lower client satisfaction, lost revenue, increased risk, higher operating costs, and ultimately underutilized talent. With HyperScience, you'll be able to reallocate headcount to more value add tasks. The second challenge is with legacy OCR system performance. OCR systems are unable to read handwriting, they can't process low quality documents, and they lack performance improvement, whereas our machine continues to improve over time. Why do our clients choose HyperScience? Here are four of the key differentiators that we find. So to start, we're able to ingest complex documents, including handwritten and poor quality documents. We're able to process these types of documents with about 70 to 95% automation from day one. And then as we see more of these documents, our machine continues to improve, improve performance over time. Additionally, we deliver our solution on-premise to mitigate security concerns. So whether that be actually on-premise or in your private cloud, it will be behind your firewall. And finally, we were built for the business user. There's no scripting. There is no need for any data science scientists to be in control. The solution is truly simple enough for any business users to use. 
Here's a diagram showing how hyperscience works at a very high level. The end user inputs a document into the machine. The machine then classifies the document and prepares to extract data. Your company will set the accuracy rate you're looking to achieve, and if the machine is not confident in what it's extracting, it will send out that field to what we call supervision. The human will then transcribe what is in the field that the machine raised its hand on and send the data back to the machine. From there, the machine will push the extracted data out in a JSON format. It's important to note that for the stars you see on the left and right hand side of the screen, for both document ingestion and the output, we have flexible integration options or connectors, whether it be a REST API, message queues, or RPA systems. For example, the RPA systems that we currently have partnerships with are UiPath and Blue Prism. This slide here shows some of the diverse document types that we are able to ingest. I'll start on the right-hand side. Today, we do not work with unstructured documents, for example, a lease agreement. However, what we do work with is structured and semi-structured. Structured documents, for example, a W-9 or tax form, is a document that has no change in field location. A semi-structured document is a document that has changes in both the field location as well as the field nomenclature. A good example of a semi-structured document is a bill of lading or an invoice. A quick case study to run you through is with one of our customers, TD Ameritrade. TD Ameritrade acquired Scott Trade and needed to run a compliance exercise that required an accuracy of 99.5%. There's over 1 million account opening documents that were handwritten and scanned in, so there was extremely poor quality. In order to do the exercise, TD Ameritrade was going to need to add 60 additional data entry heads and use a legacy OCR system. Ultimately, what they found was the OCR system could not handle the poor quality of documents or the handwritten documents. However, hyperscience was brought in and we were able to automate 80% of the work on day one. And after three months, the machine grew more confident on TD Ameritrade's forms and we were able to achieve 95% automation. As a result, TD Ameritrade achieved four times throughput, doubled their processing speed, reallocated 50% of their existing data keyers, and were, did not need to hire those additional 60 heads. And finally, Hyperscience wanted to do a benchmark study against our competitors, so we took 20,000 documents and put them through our machine. We compared ourselves to these other companies, for example, Google, Microsoft, Abby, and in printed, we outperformed them decently well, but where we really differentiated ourselves was in handwritten documents. You can see on the right-hand side, we were able to attain 93% accuracy, and this is entirely through the machine, versus our next closest competitor of Microsoft Azure was at 58%. Thanks everyone, we're really looking forward to being able to chat with you after the Summer Summit. Great, thank you so much Whitney. Next up we have a company that uses AI and machine learning to analyze customer behavior data to identify needs and recommend what, when, and how to make a product offer. Please welcome Juan from Fligu. Hey everyone, uh, this is Juan from Fligo, CEO and co-founder of Fligo. Thank you very much for joining us here, and it's a pleasure to be able to present uh, you the company and, and what we do. A uh, quick introduction to the company. We are um, an AI technology company based in San Francisco with offices in, in New York, uh, Sao Paulo, and Argentina, covering customers all across the continent. Um, Inside the big world of AI, we focus on customer behavior analysis and prediction. And uh, we're helping companies from several industries, uh, like some of the largest fast-moving consumer good companies, uh, retailers, uh, but definitely the most important industry for us, financial institutions, where we work with some of the largest as well. Um, what we help these companies do is really uh, we use AI to help them boost their app selling and cross-selling uh, cross revenue. Um, we have a product called Fligo Sharp AI that uses AI to analyze 
thousands of behavior variables from customer behavior, uh, ranging from demographic information, uh, bureau's information, risk information, uh, analyzing transactions with the debit cards, credit cards, how they're using the apps, the websites of the bank, etc. Multiple sources, thousands of variables that we are analyzing. Uh, that we're using to predict what exact product does each of the customers of a bank or another company need at every point in time. Uh, to then also identify what's the best way to put that product in front of them. Which means identifying the right moment to make an offer, the right channel, and the right sales pitch. In black and white, uh, the features of the solution, the main features are product recommendations, so identifying what product does each of the customers of the bank need. Uh, channel optimization, which means identifying the channel that we should use to make each of the offers. Timing optimization, predicting the right day and time to make the offer. And even uh, sales pitch optimization, uh, which analyzes the profit of the customer, or the features of the product, the reasons why the product is a fit for the customer, and based on that, making a personalized sales pitch for each of the customers. Let me show you a quick uh, sneak peek of how this looks like. This is Lisa Miller, customer of a bank. These are the products that we're recommending a bank to offer to Lisa. The uh, corresponding probability of purchase of each of these products. And then if you open any of them, we can see the products that, uh, no, the reasons why a product was assigned to that uh, customer. Uh, the sales pitch that we're making uh, based on the reasons why the product is eligible for that person. And um, it's the same for each of the products that we recommend to offer. Now, um, companies typically think about Fligo as a way of helping them increase sales by identifying the best customers to target for each product when they have a product center approach or uh, when they work with customer center approaches they think of us as a way of identifying the best product for each customer or when they have a database of potential customers, potential leads, uh, we can also help them acquire new customers by understanding what is the product that we have to offer to these people in order to bring them as new customers of the bank. Uh, in the back end, very quickly, what happens uh, is that we are uh, ingesting customer data from multiple sources that banks already have. Uh, everything happening inside their environment, data never leaves the environment of the bank. We're using all that to uh, run multiple predictive algorithms at the same time to predict what product does each of the customers need. We turn the optimal prediction into an offer and then we integrate an, uh, the offer using an API to all the communication channels that banks already have. Uh, we're, just, we're, we're not altering any of the marketing channels, we're just adding intelligence to what they're currently doing. Um, implementation takes between 60 and 90 days where we assign a team of between three and six people to each account taking care of all the implementation uh, phase so the banks don't have to. And uh, just to illustrate an example, one of the largest banks in North America is using our product to increase uh, credit cards uh, specifically uh, where we have generated a lift of 21% in total credit card sales and 44% in, uh, in sales of premium card products. Uh, of course, for COVID, we have done, we have adapted our strategy to satisfy our new customers' needs. Most of the requests we got are for retaining existing customers, boosting sales and digital channels, and also increasing revenue from existing customers to compensate for lost sales. We have an entire document about this that we can then share offline, and uh, I'm very happy to explore and help you dive into further opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Juan. Next up, we have Lemonade. They're a Canada-based award-winning learning experience platform that combines addictive micro-learning and customer support tools to drive digital product fluency. Please welcome John. Hi, folks. My name is John Finlay. I'm the CEO of Lemonade LXP, which is a learning experience platform that's built specifically to help financial institutions with the human side of digital transformation. Lemonade is a spin-off of Launchfire, which is our original company founded in 1999, built game-based promotions for packaged goods and retailers. Um, and it was the educational piece of those promotions that got us into training. Uh, clients would say, 
uh, could we morph these promotional games into e-learning programs, which we did uh, to great success. And then four years ago, when we did so for TD, we realized that the digital fluency training we built for them was something all banks needed. So we built Lemonade, which basically drives better outcome, better learning outcomes faster. Lemonade morphs the entire learning experience into a game like today's most addictive mobile and social games. And that keeps people coming back daily to take addictive micro learning, to engage in social learning. They can take remote instructor led courses, which is going to be awesome for post COVID. Uh, Lemonade's also got rapid authoring tools so you can author all your own training in there. And it's a super effective distance learning platform, which we think uh, bodes well for the post COVID world. As I mentioned, it's got game-based learning. You can author um, any number of different game styles to teach foundational knowledge. You can then also author um, uh, role play scenarios to teach um, sales and customer service training. And then it's got technology walkthroughs and product simulations, so you can simulate your technologies, be them customer-facing mobile apps, online banking, or internal um, softwares you need people to learn. Lemonade's also got a digital adoption platform baked in. So these same technology walkthroughs that you author, you can then put on an automatically generated, customer-facing, WCAG-compliant, branded website to um, allow customers to self-help, um, to take uh, call, call volumes off your contact centers, and to empower frontline staff when they get inquiries. So essentially, Digital Academy helps reduce call volumes and talk times while improving customer service. So how's it doing? Um, so mid-sized banks typically use Lemonade as their de facto learning platform because it does so much better than typical LMSs. And what they see is an 84% voluntary participation rate, which is massive, um, and they see a knowledge increase of 25%. The larger financial institutions use us for specific training tasks. One of the most popular is digital adoption. And those guys see a 91% increase in digital product recommendations, um, and they see a significant lift in mobile app uses, one got a 12% increase in mobile remote check deposit. Um, and then those who use this for digital academy, they see a 24% reduction in talk times. What are the learners saying about it? 92% um, prefer Lemonade training to other forms of training. 87% of employees say they um, it improves, helps improve digital fluency. And 88% of employees want all their training delivered in Lemonade, which really bodes well for both um, ongoing training and distance learning where it's going to be harder to engage. Uh, learners. Who are we working for? I mentioned the large banks who use this for specific tasks like US Bank, TD Bank, uh, National Bank of Australia, and then a number of smaller banks and credit unions that use us really as a de facto learning platform. Where are other opportunities we see? Well, selling direct, we see great opportunity insurance. We have a channel partner using it for insurance training. We've had inquiries from healthcare. We have tremendous relationships in retail and food and bed, being the agency record for Coca-Cola and Costco and a whole bunch of others. So we see great opportunity there. And then public education. We think there's a great opportunity as public education looks for great effective remote training tools. Then we also see great channel partnership opportunities with fintechs who want to drive adoption of the technology so they make more money. Call center vendors who could add a digital adoption platform to help call centers and sort of round out their offering. Professional services companies who are helping um, uh, organizations with digital transformation. Lemonade could be part of their offering. And then training vendors who need to modernize their offerings. Let's say they're only instructor-led training or they're in-person training. Um, Lemonade can help them offer um, a remote learning platform. So there's lots of opportunities for channel. That's Lemonade in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Again, it's John Findlay. You see my contact information. If you have any questions or would like a demo, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. All right, next up we have Blue Rush. They're an interactive personalized video platform to engage customers, simplify complex products, motivate, motivate action, and accelerate the buyer journey. Um, please welcome Matt. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Robel and I'm an account director at Blue Rush. Our technology in the video is an already in market marketing platform that focuses on bringing three elements together, personalization, video, and scale. And we're tackling a major problem that exists today, low engagement communications. When we look at today's touch points, they're often the same. Customers are peppered with dry, long emails and print marketing material. Offers are complex and don't help paint the bigger picture and staff get frustrated and explain the same information over and over again. In the end, customers are disengaged and don't take an action leading to higher costs. So how do you help bring a more impactful experience and give customers a better reason to pay attention, but also help get rid of these inefficiencies? 
This is where our technology comes to play. Let's look at an example. One of the most popular projects we've done is with TD for a product selector. So a customer uses a product selector, they're recommended a particular credit card, and they are given the kitchen sink approach of everything they need to know about their credit card. So the card, the spend, the fee, their interest, et cetera, et cetera. But you'll see now, instead of simply just having you read the information, we could dynamically generate a personalized video for you based on why this card is best suited for you. So I'll show you an example of how this comes to life. Hi, based on your answers, it appears that the TD Aeroplan Visa Infinite card is the best choice for you. According to your average monthly spend, you could earn this much in Aeroplan miles in your first year. That could be enough to qualify for this reward. With the TD Aeroplan Visa Infinite card, you earn one and a half miles for every dollar you spend on eligible grocery, gas, and drugstore purchases and aircanada.com purchases. Earn one mile for every dollar you spend on all other purchases with your card. You also earn miles twice when you pay with your card and present your Aeroplan membership card at participating retailers and the Aeroplan e-store. And as your welcome bonus, you'll receive 15,000 Aeroplan miles when you make your first purchase. In addition to great travel benefits, this card also includes insurance, Visa Infinite benefits, and much more. Plus, your projected Aeroplan miles. Just click the Apply Now button on the page below to get started. So you're seeing one variation, but it shows you the power of dynamic personalized videos. Now let's take a slightly different approach. Let's look at an example where instead of sending out a bland, flat investment statement that does little to help you understand the bigger picture on your investments, imagine a video that runs you through your options and makes it feel like you have an advisor by your side. Hi. Here is an AFP Habitat video to explain your pension savings statement for March 2019. Your total voluntary savings is this amount and is distributed as follows. From the total amount shown, this is the investment you've made in Habitat. And this amount is the profit you've earned. Out of the last 12 months, you've contributed 10 months to your voluntary savings account. Remember to contribute each month, since gaps in your contributions can have a direct impact on your retirement pension total. Do you know how much pension income you'll have in retirement? As of March 2019, this is the amount we estimate you'll receive in monthly pension income. So you've now seen two examples, but when you think about all the possibilities of the touch points from acquisition to retention to win back, etc., there are many, many different situations where adding a personalized video can turbocharge that experience. So if there is of interest of chatting with us, we're Blue Rush. My name is Matt, and we look forward to speaking with you further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Blue Rush. Next up, we have Spiro. They're the first proactive relationship management platform that consolidates CRM capabilities, sales enablement, and analytics into one single platform. Please welcome Justin. Hey, everyone. My name is Justin Kao, and I am one of the co-founders of Spiro.ai out of Boston. At Spiro, we're using AI to create a whole new way for your team to manage the customer experience. Before starting Spiro, my co-founders and I, we all used to be CRM consultants. So one thing we knew from our experience is that CRM is one of those things that businesses spend tons of money on, but they always wind up hitting the end product. The numbers are astounding. If you look at the studies from these top research firms, you can see that people overall are very unsatisfied with CRM. The promise of it is really amazing, but often the end results just don't deliver. And my co-founders and I, we spent a lot of time thinking about that issue. And the way that CRM works today, it's totally reactive. You have to create your own accounts, your own contacts, your own opportunities, log your own activities, manage your own follow-ups. When you throw in the effects of COVID on top of all of this, where a lot of sales teams are now largely distributed or working from home for the first time, you'll find way more inefficiencies than ever in understanding what your sales team is actually up to. The epiphany we had at Spiro was that the whole premise of CRM itself is backwards. Uh, CRM itself is a reactive tool, and we realized the world needed the, exactly the opposite. It needs a proactive tool. Your software should use AI to automatically understand who you're talking to, organize your conversations, and automatically prompt you to follow up. And that's exactly what we built with Spiro. 
we're calling it proactive relationship management because uh, it's designed to be totally proactive. The way it works is that we provide you with an AI-powered telephony system. Uh, we integrate with your email, your calendar, as well as plug in your pipeline data, any other data from any internal systems, and we put that all into our own predictive models, which Spiro then uses to make proactive recommendations. Uh, most people use Spiro via the assistant. So think of it as like uh, the most on-the-ball executive assistant you've ever had. It knows who I'm talking to, uh, more probably more importantly, it knows who I'm not talking to and who I should be talking to, and the model makes dynamic, ever-changing recommendations based on the data it consumes. These recommendations are always filtering, changing, based on what I'm doing, actually doing in my day-to-day -day job. And much like a real executive assistant, I can also communicate directly with Spiro. I can talk to it via email or chat tools like Slack, and I can ask it basic natural language questions like an update on a specific customer or an update on my pipeline. Spiro knows who I am and automatically responds with the right relevant information. The fancy features are great, uh, but the best part about this is that it works. Um, we took some sample data from teams fully utilizing Spiro and found that we were driving some pretty incredible growth metrics across some key sales activities. And we found with the increase in visibility, we were really able to help teams close more opportunities. In a post-COVID world, our current customers are relying on us now more than ever. There's an actual text that a customer sent to me shortly after everything started. We're helping them manage a 100% remote sales team for the first time, and they would have a really tough time understanding anything that their sales team was up to without using Spiro. A little bit more about us. We have offices in Boston and Singapore. We have about 200 customers, including Plug and Play. Uh, and if you are a company who wants to learn more about how to use AI in your customer experience, please reach out to me. My email's here. Uh, if you want to learn more, here's our website, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next up, we have V2 Verify. They're a voice by metric technology that can eliminate the need for passwords, pins, and challenge questions with incredible accuracy, even while wearing a face mask. Um, I know that's something I could definitely use. <laughs> All right, let's go. Uh, welcome, Corey. Hi, I'm Corey Miller, Vice President at V2 Verify. We are a startup based in Omaha, Nebraska, specializing in voice biometrics. I'd like to start off by asking everyone a question. How would you like to never have to remember a username, password, PIN, or an answer to a security question the rest of your life? I think it's safe to say that most hands went up virtually. Well, that is exactly what we do at V2 Verify. With two seconds of speech, we can authenticate at a 99.1% .1 success rate with built-in liveness, making us multi-factor. And we do this across all customer touch points, in person, over the phone, web, or mobile. I'd like to show you guys a quick demo. Here's our mobile banking demo app. I'm gonna hit the login button here and it's gonna ask me to repeat some numbers about the length of a phone number. 3287. 8942, 3731. Okay, so that logged me in to mobile banking app in about two seconds. This same technology is being used to address a variety of use cases. Identity access management, authenticating in a call center, workforce management, automated password resets, both for internal employees and customers, securing IoT and multi-factor authentication. While we have a heavy focus in banking and financial services, we are addressing these use cases across all industries. One of the most recent use cases that we addressed, a POC we completed in March in Vietnam for the largest telco provider there was for mobile logins for a mobile wallet. Uh, we had a variety of different test scenarios, controlled, at workstations, indoors, outdoors, and break, break attempts. And we also introduced a new component into testing, which was masks. 
96% of testers wore masks, and we still completed this POC at a 99.4% overall accuracy with a 0% false accept rate. Coming out of this, COVID-19 has presented us a number of new use cases. Our contact center clients have now asked us to authenticate their call center agents who are working remotely. Uh, with the rise in digital and video banking, we've had a number of new use cases there that we're addressing for our banking partners. And with the rise or really push for touchless or contactless authentication, uh, we feel like we are very well positioned uh, for that growth. With that said, um, we are fundraising, um, currently seeking $800,000 um, to continue to support the POCs that we have through the back half of the year um, to grow our team and to also grow our brand. If you are interested in learning more about our voice biometric um, and the use cases we are addressing and the improvements we are helping in the customer experience, please reach out. My contact information is below. Great, thank you, Corey. Next up, we have Siloed AI. They're based in Singapore and they forge the next generation banking ecosystem by combining intelligent decision-making with a customer-centric digital product, acting like a super brain for FIs. Please welcome Shofi. Greetings, everyone. This is Shofi from Siloed. We are a Singapore-based fintech company that aim to bring advanced banking solutions for financial institutions to engage and serve SMEs more swiftly and at a lower cost. We're very happy to be in plug and play again this year after batch 11 in the United States. To begin with, I'd love you guys to meet our core team. They are a group of fintech veterans from banks like Citibank, financial institutions like MasterCard, and internet companies like Baidu. Most recently, we are nominated as the top 100 fintech by KPMG, and we have already established a strategic partnership with Visa and MasterCard. Most importantly, we have filed two patents on knowledge and inference construction that are the source of the wisdom of our decision engine. To explain a little bit more, Silo Decision Engine transforms the data into knowledge and derives the knowledge into scalable decisions for different use cases in the financial institutions across different departments. This has been proven successful and supported by two of our patents which I introduced just now. To be more specific, our decision engine is able to generate intelligent and scalable decisions such as transaction anti-fraud and anti-money laundering, real-time eKYC, instant loan underwriting, and other value-adding decisions in terms of marketing and cross-selling. Our engine can conduct a 360-degree comprehensive background analysis for small businesses and individuals to help you in many different scenarios such as supply chain, credit card application and approval, rapid onboarding, loan origination, fraud tracing, etc. etc. Now, let me show you a demo of our product. This is where you can seamlessly manage your SME businesses. Starting from onboarding, you can check review and approve the application in this portal. Our KYC engine is able to provide you with additional insights. It helps you with the business validation, the proof of ownership, and the trustworthiness with reasons provided. Under the facts page, it helps you to explore the relationship of the owner and the business. After onboarding, you can manage your merchant's accounts and their daily transactions. We help you with anti-fraud and generate daily reports with business intelligence about your merchants. At the same time, you can enable your merchants with precise marketing campaign to expand their business as well as your revenue. Lastly, under the microloans, our system can proactively offer pre-approved loans to the merchants. It saves you tons of time and cost for the underwriting, and you can simply go inside to amend, offer, or reject the loan. And that's a rough introduction on our solutions. So how's our progress so far? After we enable the banks with our decision engine, the operation cost has been reduced by 60% and the system configuration time has reduced drastically. We have received 92% of satisfaction from our direct serving merchants. 
with the capability of our intelligent and scalable decisions, the KYC speed improved by 200 times, while the underwriting has been 150 times faster than before, not even mentioning the manpower saved. Our anti-fraud engine has helped to reduce 29% of the passive fraud cases in different banks. Together with a unified experience, we have driven the upsell and cross-sale opportunities in banks by almost three times than before. That's how we help other banks and financial institutions. We hope to help you as well with our decision engine and solution matrix. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We will be very happy to share more details during the deep dive session tomorrow. Thank you, Silo. Next up, we have CypherTech Solutions. Um, they allow FIs to offer instant digital issuance and virtual card, man card management for their customers from any digital channel in their organization. Please welcome Walter. Hi, everyone. I am Walter Caroga, founder and CEO of CypherTech Solutions. Thank you for taking the time to join the presentation. Today, we will be discussing our digital first platform, Issue Direct, and its instant digital issuance capabilities. In today's connected world, digital has shaped perception of simplicity, speed, and convenience. Just as commerce has changed, so has the rise of digital and contactless payments and consumer expectations about how they pay and how quickly they get access to funds. That is why at CypherTex, we are working to lead the next revolution of real-time payments. Especially with the current pandemic, this has propelled the need for self-service and contactless payments now more than ever. So as digital payments evolve, so do the requirements and expectations for the industry that provides the services. Sadly, digital enablement is still largely dependent on a physical card. Most banks are here, an account is created, then it's approved. Seven to 10 days later, a card is received by mail. Some cards will get activated, then fewer become digitally enabled, added to Apple and Google Pay. Then by day 10, and beyond, card usage starts. Some are closer with temporary solutions, offering cards in branch or virtual cards, but temporary credentials cannot be enabled on a digital wallet. So consumers still find themselves carrying physical cards because current digital banking methods and applications fall short of offering the most effective way for digital banking convenience and security. Issue Direct Platform can authenticate a user and enable a fast, convenient, and secure payment credential delivery worldwide, 24-7, and supports many new payment use cases. Instant digital issuance streamlines the path to immediate customer engagement. The permanent credential is created, activated, then digitally added to the wallet of choice on day one with immediate access to funds. Having immediate customer engagement drives higher activation, usage, and revenue. It can help financial institutions and businesses increase customer satisfaction by delivering a faster and simpler payment experience. So what are the benefits of Issue Direct? It provides financial institutions with a comprehensive, quick-to-market platform, allowing for a wide range of payment solutions, end-user authentication, and card management lifecycle without disrupting the existing ecosystem of core banking applications and processor relationships. Our team is comprised of passionate individuals with extensive experience in financial services and technology. Our board and advisors lend us decades of experience from companies like Valley Bank, Visa, MasterCard, PNC, and other financial companies. I will now play a short video with a use case.
hope you enjoyed that video. To date, we have completed a seed round of $2.1 million from investors, acquired a patent on our issuance technology, and our product is live in the market. We are now looking for strategic investment from the right partners. If that sounds like you, or you would like to see a demo of our product to discuss potential partnerships, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. Yes, I think we all enjoyed that video. Next up, uh, we have Fiddler Labs, who's the leader in explainable AI and operational AI. Laylee, please tell us a little bit more about that. Hi, everyone. My name is Laylee, and I'm here with Fiddler Labs. Nice to meet you. I'm here to talk about explainable AI as a platform today here at Fiddler. So today, a lot of black box AI causes confusion, doubt, and risk, whether that is customer mistrust, uh, negative PR, moral implications. Um, unfortunately, none of these situations are good, and often a lot of the news gets into the headlines, and these are things enterprises would like to avoid. At Fiddler, we believe that the potential benefits of AI are obviously undeniable. It's gonna increase efficiency across enterprises, um, but the best business decisions are made with humans, data, and explainability at its core. So what is explainable AI? Here is a very consumer friendly example. On at Facebook, you can go ahead and look at any of your posts and see why am I seeing this post? And they launched this feature last year. Um, our CEO was actually the engineering lead on this project and they got started after the 2016 elections. So you can kind of understand why you're seeing anything, everything you're seeing in the newsfeed. So our CEO and co-founder left their companies and started Fiddler as an explainable AI platform designed for the enterprise. Fiddler is a world-class explainability platform and we provide three major capabilities, monitoring, explainability, and governance. First, monitoring. Often companies focus on efforts to deploy their models, but don't focus on ensuring that the models are performing the way that they were supposed to. Uh, so our monitoring solution provides continuous monitoring uh, to ensure the performance. Second, we have explainability um, to allow users to understand and analyze their models and understand the why behind the black box AI. Lastly, we have AI governance. Um, monitoring and explainability are part of governance, but our platform allows for users to track and remove bias from their models, audit decisions, and predictions and to make sure that they're just ultimately complying with all sorts of industry regulations. So Fiddler is a general purpose explainability platform that we work across all different platforms. As you can see here, we'll plug into pretty much any data warehouse and any modeling layer that you want. Um, and we can work across different use cases. We also allow for different um, deployment models. So we can either deploy deploy on customer on-prem, our cloud, or your cloud, depending on any of your needs. Here, uh, we've been lucky to have some market momentum. We got named as Gartner's Cool Vendor of 2019. Uh, as explainability becomes more of a hot topic, we've seen a lot of uh, momentum in the world of you know, PR. <laughs> so we've been lucky with that. Lastly, a little bit about our company. Our, as I said, our CEO and co-founder led the explainability project at Facebook. Previously, he was at Pinterest, Twitter, and Microsoft. Our other co-founder, Amit, was working at Samsung uh, in their sh shopping app, you know, trying to deal with explainability as well. And then they joined forces to start Fiddler. Our head of data science comes from Google Brain, and he actually co-authored one of the more popular explainability algorithms used today called Integrated Gradients. And the rest of our team is, comes from a wide variety of great companies in the area. And we've been lucky to be backed by some of the uh, great VCs leading in the enterprise space. Thank you for your time. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email at laylee.fiddler.ai. And looking forward to speaking to some of you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Laylee. Next up, we have Factius, who was formerly known as Arm Insight, which was the name that they used for Selection Day, but they rebranded and they use a synthetic data process to transform raw transaction data into actionable information. Please welcome Chad. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting me join you here today. My name is Chad Whitney, and I run the data partnership business here at Factius. We are not your typical startup. We've been around for about 10 years and really made our name on helping financial institutions access and unlock the power of the data that they had within their own organizations. Uh, it currently, as the slide shows, we work with over 6,000 FIs. Uh, and really, for the past six years, we have been focused on compliantly monetizing synthetic data for over 1,000 of those institutions. I'll talk about that process and, and what it looks like over the next couple of minutes. The fact is this patent pending synthetic data process allows FIs to essentially create fake but statistically relevant data. Uh, this type of data is different from what most people refer to as raw and anonymous data in that it has no referenceability back to an actual user. Uh, that allows the FIs to work safely with it internally, with third parties, and recognize revenue by allowing us to monetize it on their behalf within our partner community. Synthetic data complies with all privacy and banking regulations and really represents a great way to action data internally and externally within an organization. Beyond internal and external monetization, there's tremendous benefit we are deriving by working with uh, the likes of academics, government agencies, and other data companies to try and stay ahead of things like, for instance, COVID hotspots and helping with COVID spread detection as well as economic indicators and insights that are driving policy creation and meaningful change right now in the government as we go through this pandemic. We're able to work with these types of entities really because of the expertise we have in-house in the form of our data scientists, as well as obviously the risk-free, statistically relevant nature that synthetic data brings to market. As I mentioned earlier, beyond providing partners uh, the technology to synthesize data, we also productize synthetic data in various ways per the needs and capabilities of our buying partner community. Uh, for sophisticated buyers with large data, data teams, we typically stream uh, our enhanced row level synthetic data to them to work through and analyze. Uh, for less data sophisticated buyers, will still enhance the data and will actually aggregate data per their interests uh, and, and needs. Uh, if there's certain tickers or certain industries that they're looking at. And lastly, for the advisor or investor that is looking for KPI level information, we deliver insights to them via our enlightenment product, which you'll see here. Enlightenment is a SaaS-based platform that allows organizations and advisors to quickly assess certain companies, industries, or really look at how states and regions are impacted economically during something like the pandemic we're currently experiencing with COVID. Uh, there's tremendous flexibility in the way our clients can work with and assess the information within Enlightenment. And we also offer trial periods as a way to make sure that as you step into this platform, you're getting out of it what you need before spending or investing any money uh, within the product set. The last thing that I really wanted to hit on today in closing is, is just, again, uh, as a recap, highlight that we really focus on helping companies recognize the internal and external value of their data through synthesization. And we can deliver significant revenue within months via our pet partner network, keeping all parties anonymous within the transaction and protecting that anonymity throughout the process as well as the entire relationship. Finally, the last thing I really wanna do is, is thank Plug and Play for what we have uh, really enjoyed throughout this process. The collaboration, not only with the members of our batch group, but the entire plug and play partner community has just been uh, fantastic and something that we have greatly benefited from. Um, we look forward to being an alumni and continuing to develop and foster the relationships that we already have. Thank you once again. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Take care. Thank you so much, Chad, and very happy to hear that you had a good experience with Plug and Play um, for the past couple of months. So next up, we have Everplans. Uh, they're the leading digital tool that helps people organize, store, securely share, and keep up to date all the important plans and information they need and that their family would need in the case of an emergency. So now I'll hand it over to Harris to tell us a little bit more about that. 
Hi, everyone. Harris Share with Everplants. Excited to be here today to share an update with you and tell you a little bit about what we've been up to. There's never been a more important time to help families become more prepared. We just did a study with Quest Research that went out to about 1,000 Americans the last week of April. And we found that 64% of Americans say that planning for the future is more important than ever. And not surprising, right? Half of Americans say that, that we're interviewed say that, 50% um, say that COVID-19 has made them realize how unprepared they were for a serious emergency. One in five need help. Um, they say they don't do it well today. And you know, 65% um, said that COVID-19 made them realize the importance of sharing this information with their family members. You know, so many families have um, sticky notes on the side of their computer and information written down on notepads on their countertop. Well, 40% told us that they have written down accounts login, written down their account logins and passwords. Very few um, people have a written will or have taken out life insurance or not enough, right? And 36% have talked to their children about death. That's where Everplans comes in. Everplans helps families get prepared for any situation um, getting organized around information from wills and trusts to financial accounts and insurance policies. And we're helping families not only organize that information and get engaged around these planning topics, but we're helping them share this information with their loved ones and their family members. And we're putting people in control of their personal and financial lives. It's broken down into four core areas. We have the most comprehensive digital vault driven by education and guidance. We have thousands of articles that drive to our, our public website, millions of people every single year who are interested in taking the next step in different types of planning topics around how to write a will, how to choose a life insurance policy, or how to choose a power of attorney. We're helping people share that information with their loved ones that they choose. They want to share specific access at the right moments in their lives. And we're helping people keep that information up to date over time. We distribute it through financial services companies, insurance carriers, and we have rolled it out to multiple Fortune 500 companies who are making it available as well to their employees as an employee benefit. Now, how does it work? It's a guided platform. We're not just this open folder or box that people put information into, but it's a place where people go to store information and be driven throughout their lives, depending on the moment that they're in, to put the information into their ever plan that's important and relevant based on where they're at in their particular lives. You can see here on the left hand side is our secure storage. You'll see in the middle is our guidance engine breaking the ever plan down bit by bit. And then once you pick in, once you put information into the ever plan, we encourage you to share information with your deputies, which are those loved ones that we want to make sure have access to the information that they need to have access to at the moments that they need to see it. And it doesn't have to be just for end of life or emergency, but it's any situation that helps people um, have that information at their fingertips. Now, you know, Everplans has been around for 10 years. We've been on a mission to help families become more organized and more prepared. And we're also partnered with organizations to help them get more engaged with their customers over the course of their entire lives. So no matter what life moment they're in, Everplans is there to help identify the right moments for cross-selling, upselling, and developing more meaningful relationships. We'd love to talk with your organization about how our plans might fit in for your customers, for your policyholders, or for your employees. And we're really excited to be, be here today, partnered with Plug and Play, and um, please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Harris, for that. Next up, we have Truck Circle, whose goal is to give businesses control over their cash flow by making sure that every work is paid on time. Let's learn more about how they do this. Yuma, please take the stage. Hi, I'm Yuma, co-founder and CMO at Truck Circle. Thank you for having us at the Summer Summit. As a business owner, you struggle to meet your payment deadlines, especially if you are waiting for a payment from your client to be able to pay your supplier. Delayed payments cause a financial gridlock problem, and it doesn't only affect one business, but the whole network of businesses that are interrelated. Affected businesses will suffer from penalties and extra costs, 
wouldn't have control over their cash flow and wouldn't have control over their payment date. We at Rock Circle have developed an accessible netting platform that allows users to offset receivables with payables, ensuring the debt is reduced to the minimum. We only require the invoice data and our smart algorithm will search for netting deal and propose it to users to help them meet their payment deadlines, accelerate the velocity of payments and reduce debt to the minimum. I will be sharing an introductory video that explains what we do. This is Linda. She runs an awesome insurance business that Alex uses to insure his shipments of raw material from overseas, which in turn Mo depends on to keep his factory running so he can create his products, which his buyers are waiting for. And this chain goes on and on. While this story seems straightforward, you'd expect the money flow to be the same. Well, we all know it's not. Money collection takes time and no one can pay before they get paid. So that's where we step in. Truck Circle detects common dependencies in the payment chain and proposes group deals by offsetting receivables with payables, something we call netting. All you need to do is upload your invoices and our smart algorithm will help you and other nodes in the chain pay and get paid at once without moving any money. And all that in a fast, easy and secure platform. Truck Circle, we help you get paid. Thank you for listening. So our solution is, is um, divided into three payment types, circular netting, chain netting, and one-to-one -one payments. Both circular and chain netting are based on mathematical formulas that simplifies the complex payment chain into a simple one-to-one -one payment. Our service fee is 1% per netted amount. It is faster than factoring and cheaper than factoring, easier than taking a loan, and even cheaper than the cost of electronic processing machines. Truck Circle is a win-win solution for all users. It accelerates the velocity of payments at a very low cost. It saves you money. It reduces the risk of bad debts by helping businesses meet their payment deadlines. It lowers your overdraft margins. It is a new cashless revenue model that helps businesses pay and get paid at a low cost with no FX fees and no transactional costs. We are a team of experts, each from a different background. Each one of us got affected by late payment costs and now we have developed the solution for it. We are currently on the verge of starting a new pilot in the MENA region. We are bootstrapped so far and raising our first pre-seed round of 200K to reach a new milestone. Thank you for your time. We are Truck Circle, the first accessible netting platform in the world. Thank you so much, Yuma. Next up, we have Telos Touch, who's the first remote engagement platform that enables financial institutions to convert real-time client needs into meaningful actions. With the current crisis, Telos Touch is filling a very timely gap in working with five of the largest FIs in Canada and the US. Jad, please take the stage. Hello everyone, Jad Shalawi here, founder and CEO of Telos Touch. Let's face it, not much has changed in the way institutions work remotely with their clients. Think about it. Phone calls, meetings, nowadays virtual meetings, email campaigns, client portals, and maybe a seminar or a conference. These traditional channels are time-consuming, static, and inefficient. So we don't have an easy way to engage clients remotely and execute at scale. And this limits our ability to see changing needs and to act on them. And this leaves value on the table for clients and for institutions. Telos Touch is the first remote engagement and execution platform to serve all your clients when it matters most. Our technology augments relationships with data that you don't have yet need to increase client loyalty and client opportunities. Let me show you how Telos Touch complements your existing tech stack. With Telos Touch, Institutions can build event or product-driven experiences. 
roll them out to advisors through their CRM to personalize how they communicate with their clients and get to understand what's happening in clients' lives by revealing real-time context, needs, and behaviors. While a lot of fintechs are focused on the back office, we made a conscious decision to only focus on the front office. And the current crisis is showing us that rethinking your client engagement model is no longer a nice competitive advantage to have. It's becoming the sole purpose of financial institutions that want to bring value to their clients. Think about it. Clients are at home anxious, not knowing which action to take. Advisors are working remotely, not knowing when to intervene. No wonder institutions are actively finding solutions for that problem. And the demand for our technology has increased tremendously in the last 90 days. We were already working with five of the largest financial institutions in Canada and the US. But after the COVID-19 crisis, they came to us and asked us to expedite our ability to launch and to deliver a COVID-19 response for all their clients. Let me give you an example. The market has just corrected. Usually institutions send a mass email to all their clients. But how can they know who needs a human intervention today? With Telos Touch, institutions can build digital experiences that were previously impossible. In the same experience, they could send a personalized video from the client's advisor, a question to better understand current concerns. They can share intelligently content that deals with that concern. And by the end of that experience, institutions can know who needs a phone call, who's okay, and who needs probably more information in order to make better decisions. So if you're looking to redefine how institutions and clients work together, we would love to share with you how Telos Touch is the missing link to stay in the know and easily act when it matters. Thank you. Thank you, Jed. Next up, we have Direct ID. Uh, they use open bank data to help businesses onboard customers where there's a credit risk decision. Please welcome James. Direct ID is a global open banking data platform that lets businesses onboard customers quickly and easily. Especially in today's world, in a post-pandemic and COVID environment, it is more important than ever to really understand the credit risk and affordability of an individual. We've seen a huge increase in the adoption of bank data or open banking. A lot of businesses still require individuals to send in physical copies of bank statements. That is something Direct ID can solve within just a couple of days with no integration. But also we now live in this world where relying on traditional data sources from credit reference agencies and bureaus, data that can be at least six to 12 months out of date, doesn't have the timeliness that really reflects an individual's current situation. The Direct ID platform consists of three main components. The first one is Direct ID Connect, which is our pre-built user experience for connecting an individual to their consumer or business bank account. Direct ID Connect is a button that can be quickly and easily placed on a page that lets the individual go through the process of authenticating and connecting their bank account. This is a process that takes on average between five and 10 seconds, supports today 13,000 connections to banks over 45 or more countries. And once the user connects their bank account, you then have data available through the Direct ID platform. Direct ID supports a single data API for one point of integration to allow you to pull back the bank data from those connected accounts into your back office systems. The Direct ID dashboard is our reporting tool for underwriters, agents, or fraud investigators to gain quick and easy access to someone's bank statement records. This tool allows the agent to not only send requests to have individuals share their bank statement, but to view that data itself 
to export that as CSV files or PDF reports, or to look into the data, looking for specific transactions. Most of our focus at Direct ID is really helping businesses to understand the value of bank data. To do that, we have a set of pre-built reports available through Direct ID Insights that lets you quickly and easily understand the overall behavior of that financial profile. Direct ID Insights is a full business intelligence tool that allows you to unlock the value of bank data. It allows you to create your own reports or edit any of the pre-built reports that we can provide. This is an example focused on consumer lending that highlights things like cash flow, loan repayments, or gambling as a sign of emerging financial distress. Also within the Direct ID platform are a number of products that are designed to solve specific parts of the credit risk or affordability challenge. The first one is our income verification module. This is where we use machine learning and pattern detection within a bank account to highlight and understand the sources of income. This works for any gig economy, casual or transient worker, as well as the monthly salaried. Our affordability product, which you see here, combines our income verification with spending behaviors to understand the overall affordability of an individual. One of the options Direct ID supports is a zero integration option, where we set up a landing page and we give you access to the reporting tools so that you can use the platform to start making decisions based on bank data in just a matter of days. Above and beyond the benefit that traditional Bureau, FICO, CFAS, and other Bureau-based services can provide, bank data has had a huge impact. Our customers have seen a 45% increase in conversion while reducing their overall fraud by 7.5%. Given the disruption COVID has made in the market, now more than ever, leveraging bank data can have a huge impact in business, not just in credit risk decisioning or online lending, but across a range of use cases. Thanks for taking the time, and if you have any questions, please do get in touch. Thank you, James. Next up, we have Art. This Dublin-based startup is the only company in the world providing a solution for virtual card customization, including cards inside the Apple Wallet. So Lena, tell us a little bit more about that. Hello, everyone. My name is Lena, and I'm head of business development at Art. Here are also some of our team members. I'm happy to, to tell you more about our solution and provide some of the case studies. So what do we do? Essentially, we help banks achieve these fascinating results, up to 62% increase in the number of transactions and up to 39% increase in activations. And we do that by providing them with a turnkey solution to create customized payment cards. Whether we like it or not, but a bank card has become a commodity. An average person has five cards, but ends up using only one. Banks rely heavily on rewards to become the one. Bad news is rewards are very expensive and don't necessarily work. They can increase the number of transactions only up to 10%. Customization is a far better solution. Customization can increase the number of transactions up to 62%, with an average being between 30 and 40%. It also creates this emotional connection between a bank product and customer that results in better retention rates and all of that for an additional dollar or two per card, which is our fee. Of course, in order to get to those impressive results, customers shall be able to order a card. This, that is why the process is so important. We build an integrated tool stack to efficiently manage the entire process of image upload and approval, including screening. Also important to note that we integrate ourselves seamlessly into the existing process of card ordering and printing with a set of APIs. User interface is also crucial for the overall success of the program. So we provide banks with an applet that is easy to navigate. And we also build this AI powered screening mechanism that provides instant feedback to the customers, whether the image they uploaded can or cannot be used for the card. This results in customers being happy and ordering those customized cards that they're going to use more often. Here is an example of how our algorithm, AI screening algorithm works. So when a customer uploads a picture, it checks it against those 15 categories set out by payment networks. And in case it detects uh, some of that that is not allowed to be on the card, it tells the person so, and the image is being rejected. And we ask the customer to upload a new one instantly. Our uh, solution is very easy to integrate with just one line of code. We manage the entire image upload and approval process. 
and our image screening complies with all requirements set out by all payment networks. We don't store, process, or collect any personal data. Here are some of the cool case studies that we are very proud of with the Raiffeisen Bank in Europe. They used our solution for credit cards and they see an impressive 34% increase in the number of transactions. Then they used it for debit cards as well. I've seen an even more impressive increase of 42%. This one's brand new product, so we don't have any stats on it yet, but I think customization can really be a game changer for the prepaid card. It actually becomes a very cool gift card, so it generates additional volume for banks. And in case the card is reloadable, people are more willing to reload a customized card and generating revenue for the bank as well. So more than 10 million cards were already issued with our solution. We're originally uh, based out of Dublin, Ireland, but we now have an American entity and uh, looking for partners in the US. Uh, here's my email, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to talk about your current card programs and how we can help. Thank you, bye. Thanks, Lena. Next up, we have Select. Uh, this is a company that's creating the next generation credit and debit card that focuses on what consumers want the most, powerful and unique rewards. Let's learn more about the company that various media outlets are calling Amex for the next generation and the black card for millennials. Please welcome Carlo. Hey guys, my name is Carlo Cisco and I'm the founder and CEO of Select. So the credit card industry is massive and there are hundreds and hundreds of cards. But what ultimately differentiates one card from the next? The rewards. When you look at the rewards, you see a lot of the same things. Points you may or may not be able to use towards travel and crap that you're never ever going to use. So we thought, why can't these rewards be things that are actually useful? Why can't they be things that I would use in my daily life? Well, now they are. Introducing Select. Select is a next-gen black card that provides access to exclusive events, pricing, and perks with leading brands and venues. We partner with hundreds of top-rated local restaurants and nightlife venues, as well as premier global brands in travel, retail, entertainment, and more, giving our members access to exclusive rewards at over 1.6 million locations across the globe and online. And I'm not talking about miscellaneous points or fractional cash back. I'm talking about every time you go out to dinner or order it in, getting 20 to 30% off the full bill. Every time you go out for drinks, getting your first round on the house. Every time you travel, booking your hotel at rates that are up to 60% below the lowest publicly available and much, much more. With Select, rewards are tangible and they happen at point of sale. Let's face it, points on a statement does not equate to drink in my hand. But Select is more than an idea. We're a business. To date, we've generated over $5.5 million worth of revenue, signed up over 12,000 paying members, formed over 900 exclusive partnerships, giving our members access to benefits at 1.6 million locations. So, who are the members. In short, people that every financial institution wants to reach. Median income over 140K, average over 300K, median age 36. And today, these people are applying, signing up, and paying an extra $300 a year just to access our benefits. Imagine what's going to happen when we combine those benefits with industry leading points or cash back and a payment method that they can use every single day. So how is Select faring in the current market environment? Renewals, better than ever. New member applications, continued throughout shelter in place. New partners, adding them faster than ever before. In short, we're not just surviving, we're thriving. Because we're doing all of this with less than one third the net burn we had the same time last year. But it's not just our demographic that's allowing us to do this. It's also hustle and innovation. We added close to 100 takeout and delivery partners, hosted dozens of digital events, and added numerous lifestyle, fitness, and business benefits all during shelter in place. A little more about the team. I started my first uh, successful business when I was 18 and helped build Groupon in Japan, 
growing into over $20 million a month in just two months. The rest of the team has diverse experience across industries, giving us the foundation we need to grow this business. So what's next? Next up, we're launching our COVID Comeback Initiative. Where we're partnering with dozens of national and global brands, as well as local businesses, to leverage our expansive network of benefits to help reward people for supporting local businesses and hard-hit industries. Next up after that, raising our Series A. Next up after that, launching the Select Credit Card. Uh, what's interesting with Shelter in Place in this regard is we actually secured our second option for a credit card. And we're actually seeing interest increase across the industry. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, I think banks have sort of realized that they need this uh, low risk, high ROI demographic more than ever. And I think the idea of acquiring tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of them uh, without having to spend a dollar on marketing, because we're going to do that, makes a lot of sense. What's the future hold? Well, look, these are all uh, quotes about Select as a membership card and a mobile app, um, but we plan to turn these early prophecies into reality and truly become an Amex for the next generation. And we hope that we're able to do that in partnership with you, either as an investor or an issuing partner. Um, so reach out. Let's talk. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so much, Carlo. It sure does sound like you guys are not only surviving, but also thriving. Next up, we have Company. Uh, they're a red tech, reg tech platform for global business verification and business KYC. Please welcome Russell. Hello, everybody. My name is Russell Perry, and I'm the founder and CEO of Company. We are a global business verification and KYC platform. We are solving the regulatory burden of business know your customer by combining RPA, AI, and audit proof company data. Regulated institutions like banking groups and insurers are facing a massive problem when it comes to KYC and AML data. The information that is used to verify companies and to monitor them. And this has led to massive fines dwarfing the cost of compliance. And you'll be quite surprised that only about 5% of financial institutions today have a digital and automated solution in place for B2B onboarding. There is a solution to the low level of automation and the data gaps. Let me introduce you to RegTech by Company. We are the first line of defense for anti-money laundering by providing our clients with access to our audit-proof business KYC platform. As an example, in B2B onboarding, our clients are experiencing a cost reduction of 50% after the first month and a time reduction to onboard clients of 90%. Today, we have four product lines. Our REST API provides real-time and direct access to our global register network and can be integrated into ERP, CRM, or core banking systems very easily. Our cloud-based solution or browser-based solution can be deployed within the hour in the back office. And through our capabilities to identify shareholders, we can build a family tree of a company and the people behind instantly and on demand. And to make sure that there's an audit trail, we can record this in the blockchain. Company's approach is unique and fulfills the anti-money laundering requirements for audit-proof company data. We're not a static database of information. We are a global network with live access to primary or government sources. The information is time-stamped and the data integrity is guaranteed, ensuring that information is considered a true copy. And because we operate our own network, we've been able to expand our global coverage to more than 200 jurisdictions, covering more than 110 million companies. And we're also designated critical infrastructure because we operate the most extensive network today. Over the past few years, we've been able to expand our AI capabilities for shareholder discovery. And in our live system today, we are able to achieve a 95% confidence level. The KYB market is expected to grow to more than $12 billion in the next few years. 
we are already seeing a large uptick in demand today with our sales pipeline growing more than eightfold in the last year alone and our enterprise customers are continuing to upgrade. Adding to the demand are also the COVID economic stimulus programs that we see in North America, in Europe and in other regions of the world. We just recently closed around bringing our total funding to 14 million euros. We're now going to focus on expanding our sales product and engineering teams ahead of a Series B round in 2021. Thank you for the opportunity to present at Plug and Play today. And for news and updates, please follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. We are a company, the global business verification and KYC platform. Thank you, Russell. Next up, we have a platform that allows fans to invest in fractional shares of vintage comic books, collectible cards, fantasy art, and other alternative assets which, with huge fandoms. Please welcome Joe. Hi, my name is Joe Mahavutivani, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Mythic Markets. We turn geeky, high-value assets like vintage comics, collectible cards, fantasy art, and esports teams into publicly traded companies, allowing anybody to invest in the things they love. This is a huge market. Almost a third of the people in the U.S., including many of you in the room, consider yourselves a fan and spend over $2.5 billion annually on your favorite fandoms. This is an asset class that has beaten the market in gold and real estate over the last 10 years, but the best opportunities are out of reach because they're prohibitively expensive and rare, yet billions of fans globally covet these assets. We make it possible for anybody to buy, sell, and soon trade in fractional shares of the things they love for as little as $30. So how does it all work? We acquire high value rare collectibles. Uh, we securitize them by first forming a series LLC that owns the asset and that is securitized under Reg A plus. And these are SEC and FINRA regulated uh, securities and not crypto and blockchain. We then hold an IPO allowing accredited and unaccredited investors to participate. And we are preparing to launch a trading marketplace as well for investors to place bids, place bids and asks and clear OTC trades. Some of our milestones have been the SEC qualification and FINRA approval that took over a year and we are at half a million dollars in collection value and uh, we have a $30 million pipeline and we've laid the groundwork for this legal framework that scales up into uh, new verticals and, um, and millions of dollars in public offerings. We've completed the public offering for the Black Lotus at $90,000 uh, with 2,000 shares and that cleared in 30 days. And currently we've got these booster boxes that are currently on offer and we expect to close that within a week. Uh, so uh, yeah, what's coming up next? We've got the liquidity platform, as I mentioned, we're setting a cadence for monthly offerings in new verticals and we're continuing to grow our investor base. And so we expect to raise our series A in early 2021. And uh, this is our team. My background is in product and growth at startups of all stages, and I previously spent the last three and a half years in venture capital. Uh, the bulk of our team has known each other uh, and been friends for the last 10 to 20 years, depending on the relationship. So it's a real pleasure to be able to work with our friends. We're ultimately going well beyond collectibles to unlock over a trillion dollars in private investment opportunities. And we want to help people grow richer by investing in the things they know and love, whatever their fandom may be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Next up, we have the San Jose based startup Contique who is an AI-powered buyer intelligence platform that delivers the fastest path to revenue by accurately providing real-time pipeline insights and buyer engagement to close deals faster. Please welcome Arun. My name is Arun Lal, co-founder and CEO of Contique, and we produced the AI-powered buyer intelligence platform. Did you know that 77% of enterprises state that buying is a very complex and difficult process for them? However, the enterprise sellers that are able to personalize the buyer's journey based on the right buyer intelligence can achieve significantly shorter sales cycles, higher win rates, and larger deal sizes. But this is not a reality for most enterprise and B2B sellers out there today. To further contextualize the problem, meet John. He's a B2B sales rep at a leading video so conferencing software company. 
And he has a problem. He has a meeting with the CIO of at and in a few days to pitch a software solution. What John needs is a highly personalized presentation deck with the latest and greatest information, the right case studies, data sheets, and videos to influence the customer. What John actually faces in the company is, is as much as 25% of his critical sales time lost on finding the right information, which can exist in multiple silos with different versions and in different formats. Next, he has to take all this information and personalize it, get it customer ready in form of a deck, which is a manual process with a very poor tool experience that could take hours, if not days. But let's say he's produced this amazing uh, presentation deck for his meeting, and he goes and presents it. The problem is that there's no structured capture of feedback and insights that get generated in the meeting. And as a result of that, other sales team in the company keep reproducing or keep producing the same content over and over again and cannot benefit from the insights and the learnings that John had with his buyer. To solve this problem, we've created Contique. With Contique, John can get an automated personalized deck in a matter of minutes. The first thing he needs is a good base deck. With Contique's pitch builder, John receives recommendations on most effective decks from prior similar deals. Next, he needs slides recommendations to further tailor the deck. And with Contique, he receives slide recommendations based on the opportunity that he's working on to further personalize the deck. So in this case, since he's pitching to a telecom customer, he gets recommendations on telecom case studies that he can insert in his deck. So there you have it. In a matter of minutes, his deck is ready, and, uh, and then he can share it as a microsite with the buyer. Uh, the microsite allows for the buyer to ask questions as well as provide feedback. What he gets back in return with the engagement with the buyer are detailed engagement analytics dashboard, which provide insights on how engaged the buyer was at a slide level, at the deck level, and at the deal level. At the heart of it, Contique is a machine learning algorithm that's taking these engagement analytics um, and other contextual information and creating content effectiveness score at a deal level, deck level, slide level. And, uses, and it uses these scores to make recommendations to other B2B sellers uh, working on similar opportunities as to what content they should be using to move their deals from the current stage to the next. Contic produces higher sales productivity, shorter sales cycles, and much higher win rates. And we've demonstrated that with our strong customer momentum at companies like VMware, Tech Mahindra, Capgemini, Deloitte, uh, Informatica, and many mid-market companies. We have a strong team that's going after this opportunity, which has deep experience in building enterprise top products, as well as um, scaling them to be large scale businesses. The team has experience with companies such as Microsoft, VMware, Intel, EMC, FICO, and so on. At this stage, we're looking for new customers, as well as we have a funding round that's open. Um, we, the details of the funding round are available at seedinvest.com slash contique. And uh, thank you and we look forward to your partnerships and collaboration. We're Contique, the AI powered by our intelligence platform, and for more information, you can reach me at arunatcontique.com. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Last but certainly not least, we have Instant. They're the first AI powered online customer onboarding platform for businesses that will cover fraud loss liability for up to $100 million annually. Take us home, Mimi. Hi. I'm Mimi Salcedo, co-founder and chief product officer of Instant. We believe digital customer onboarding is broken. And while there's a lot of players in the space, no one's developed a holistic customer onboarding solution until now. A little background. Businesses know they need to deliver a frictionless signup experience, but it can be hard to balance out with fraud prevention. As a product person, I know I've felt the constant tension of bringing on more customers while also managing fraud and compliance risk. While these issues were already prevalent before COVID, digital customer onboarding has become even more critical to all businesses' success. For a long time, we've thought about customer onboarding in pretty much the same way. There's no blueprint for how to do this well, so businesses are forced to DIY solutions with an ever-increasing number of point solution vendors and data sources. Every year, you might try new point solution vendors to see if you can get more good customers or to see if you can reduce fraud. You might swap around the order of the tools in your waterfall to see if you can optimize for cost. 
you probably also have a person who's constantly tuning your waterfall as you discover, oh crap, a new fraud vector. But the thing is, customer onboarding is not your core business and it's draining way too much of your valuable time and resources. Instant was founded so that you can get back to focusing on delivering the core products and services you actually want to spend time on while leaving customer onboarding to the experts. I mentioned I'm a product person, but I'm also a fintech entrepreneur, and I've spent most of my career building and rebuilding onboarding processes to get customers into the products I actually wanted to be spending my time on. Since Instant wasn't around, I had to take the DIY approach, which meant finding and bringing in point solution vendors for all the different types of data and processing I needed to do. My co-founder, Sunil Madhu, also a serial entrepreneur, has spent the last seven years building SoCure, which now verifies the identities of customers for some of the world's most notable brands. In that time, he realized the problem with the way businesses sign up customers was bigger than any one point solution and needed to be addressed holistically. Enter Instant. I'm going to show you how with a line of code on your website, you can buy the best in class technologies to more accurately and frictionlessly verify and onboard your customers. This is our Instant dashboard, where you'll be able to create and manage your sign up forms. The first step is to choose the fields you'd like to collect from your customers. Then you can customize everything to look and feel just how your brand and flow does now. Next, you'll configure a few things, like where we should send your customers if they're accepted, declined, or need a review. We've also turned what would have been two different vendor integrations into simple checkboxes for KYC and document verification. Next, you'll encrypt everything with your public key so that only you can decrypt your customer's data, meaning you still own your customer. That's it. Just take this line of code and add it to your website or use the SDK for your mobile app. And with a few clicks and pasting some code, your customer signup process is now powered by Instant. A customer never leaves your brand's website and the form itself is styled to your specifications to fit in seamlessly. What once would have required over six vendors and a team of risk people can now be yours for a fraction of the cost and none of the headache of managing all this complexity in house. In that line of code lives our proprietary AI-powered engine, which is looking at a multitude of data points to make the most accurate determinations about who is a good customer and who poses risk. Not only can we guarantee to get you more good customers, which grows your top line revenue, but we'll put our money where our mouth is, and we're offering fraud loss liability up to $100 million. That means that if Instant says a customer is good and sends them into your business and they commit fraud, we will hold the financial liability for that. Fraud losses, be gone. If you're tired of the constant tension between new customers and, and fraud, please reach out. We're so excited to be able to enable businesses to get back to focusing on doing the work that truly matters. Leave your customer onboarding headache to us. To conclude, a huge thanks to Plug and Play for hosting us. Instant will be raising our Series A in September, and we'd love to talk to investors who share our vision. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. And that wraps up our startup presentations for today. I want to extend a huge thank you to all our Batch 11 startups for being a part of our program these last couple of months. It's been an amazing, it's been amazing to watch you all adapt and grow even throughout these, you know, unprecedented times. So please stay in touch and I, I wish you all the best of luck. With that, I'll hand it over to George to announce our corporate innovation winners. Thanks, Mona. Really appreciate it. So we have two corporate innovation awards that we'd like to present today. The first one uh, goes to actually John Deere Financial. We picked John Deere based on their high engagement with startups and other corporate partners. In the last seven months of partnership, they have done two demo days uh, as well as uh, innovation efforts uh, that showcased uh, what they did uh, to startups. Additionally, they met with over 50 startups, which translated into a POC or pilot Thank you, John Deere Financial. All right. Well, thank you, George. Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Wetzel. I'm the Senior Vice President at John Deere Financial, responsible for global sales and marketing. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you um, and accept this innovation award uh, on behalf of John Deere Financial. We are kind of new entrants in our collaboration with Plug and Play, and uh, we have really enjoyed the experience we've had so far, but more importantly, we found a tremendous value out of this relationship on many fronts. Um, one uh, is our access to uh, up and coming companies with new and innovative technologies that we wanna be able to assess and determine whether we want to collaborate and work with them on solutions for our customers. But more importantly, through 
Um, some of our town hall meetings, um, Plug and Play has been able to help our organization understand the possibilities of what's available to us. Uh, Deer is a almost 200 year old company. We're very set in our ways in serving uh, the agricultural and construction equipment markets, and we are slow to change most of the time. Um, this relationship we have with Plug and Play is really opening the eyes to a lot of folks in our organization on what is possible and beginning to explore really how we can partner and collaborate with others and not do it all ourselves. Um, we had one of our product team members come out of one of our recent uh, events with Plug and Play saying that initially they were very much a uh, challenger to the concept of working outside of the four walls of John Deere. And after understanding the capabilities of companies that they didn't even know existed before, all of a sudden now as a champion. And so we're starting to see a shift of our organization moving towards more collaboration and integration and uh, moving away from trying to do it all ourselves. So we really appreciate and value the relationship we have with Plug and Play. And we're very thankful for the recognition that you are bestowing on us and look forward to even more collaboration in the future. So with that, I'll turn it over back to George. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I can't put on my video, but no worries. We'll, we'll go ahead and, oh, here we go. All right, so our next innovation award goes to one of our other partners, Benorte. So Benorte has had super high engagement with our startups. In the past year of partnership, Benorte has been present at all FinTech selection days, as well as expos, bringing different team members from their company to better understand innovation and make a cultural change within their organization. Additionally, they have met over 100 startups and did more than eight deal flows. Thank you, Benorte. Thank you, George. Uh, my name is Guillermo Güemes. I am the innovation director in Banorte, and I happen to be very lucky to lead a team of very intelligent and very inquisitive people. First of all, I want to thank Plug and Play for this award. I want to thank Nadine, who has helped us through a lot of this process from our very first contact with them. Um, it is a very inspiring to receive these types of, of awards for the company and for the team, because it, it's a proof that we're doing something right, at least. Um, innovation in Banorte is very important and what Plug and Play provides for us is a very clean method to access the startup talent in Silicon Valley. We are not very eager to talk to companies all over the world and spend hundreds of hours on flights to try and reach them. And I think Plug and Play does that very, very well for us. Um, we find that we get a, a very good mix of companies, very good mix of products that we can address and access. And that is a very good value to the business. Um, one key thing we've managed to do during this time is talk to the business units and bring them on board and take them to the actual uh, showcases so that they understand what we're getting into and they can see the value in that. And we have, I'm not going to say reams of people trying to go, but a lot of them want to go to see what they can find for their own business units. And I think that's one of the key issues uh, in this process, which is to organize your business units to participate, not just the innovation department. Um, the next six months for us will be interesting, given all this pandemic and the, the way the bank and the financial industry itself is changing. We will be looking for more new things and new things that we can leverage quickly to provide a, a completely different service to our customers. So again, thank you very much for the award. Uh, it is an honor and that I accept on behalf of my team. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, George. Thank you very much, Guillermo. And with that, that wraps up the FinTech portion of our summer summit. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and if we can give all the startups a virtual round of applause, that'd be much appreciated. And if you can stick around, we have our enterprise 
Expo starting at 11 a.m. Pacific. With that, thank you very much and have a great day.